So now that we've completed all the steps for mounting the first sample, what's next? So what's next is the second page of the instructions which say finding the sample. So you should be aware that these instructions, the first two pages, you need to follow them by the letter. You should do everything essentially exactly as they say there, as we are going to do in a moment. The rest of the instructions are more a reference. It, it sort of explains how to do various uh, different workflows. But this, it's critical to follow this way of finding the sample because this minimizes the risk that you will slam the objective into the sample, which if you recall is one of the two main risks to the integrity of the system. So if you do things this way, the risk of that happening is very low. Uh, so please do it this way, particularly uh, when you're just starting. Okay, so let's look at these. The first step is to set the joystick to fast mode by pressing and holding the rightmost button until it beeps. So I've already shown you how to do that. Let me do it again. I'm going to press and hold this. Okay, so now it's blinking quickly. The reason we do that is we want to be able to move quickly when we're just uh, at the very beginning of the setup procedure. Select the lowest zoom setting, which is 0.63 on both the microscope and the software. That's step two. So in the microscope, the zoom setting is here. You can see it's whatever number, uh, there we go, whatever number is next to that little notch. So I need to set it to the lowest, which is 0.63. Hopefully you can see that. And I need to tell the software that I did that. So this, the software doesn't know, there's no connection between this and the software. So the software doesn't know what the zoom setting is. Therefore, we need to tell it over here in this section in the software. Now, we've made it so that the default is 0 0.63 on purpose uh, because that's sort of what we do for finding the first sample, but you still need to check and make sure that that's at 0 0.63 and not one of the many other options. Okay, so next, in the software Ultra 2 window, we need to select the 561 or OBIS laser. So, in the Ultra 2 window, here is where we select the lasers. And we do it by clicking on the name. So unfortunately, I mean, you have to extend this to see that that's the 561. There's no way for me to change these names, unfortunately. But if you click on the name, not on the checkboxes, the checkboxes are for something else. If you click here, that selects the laser. And you've heard some noises, so that, that means that the laser is selected. So it has to be grayed out. If it's not, it won't be on. We need to set the laser power to 10%. That's item B. So laser power is set through this slider here, and now it's at 10%. We should set the NA to the highest possible setting in the optic section. So in C, in the optic section, right here, this is parameter called sheet NA. We need to set it all the way to the right. And you can see many of these are the default settings, again, because we've made it on purpose so the default settings are, they start off with what you need to do when you're finding a sample. But if you modify these settings and then are um, putting on another sample, it's a really good idea to go through these instructions again to make sure you can find the sample quickly and without crashing into it. So step D, adjust the light sheet width to 20% in the optic section. So the sheet width is here. Uh, the sheet width refers to the sheet width in the wide dimension. Uh, which you'll see later. Um, so it's, it's not the width in the Z, it's the width in the Y, okay? Select the right light sheet, that's item E. So here is where you select. You can illuminate samples. Here we go, I hope you can see the mouse. Uh, select the right light sheet. You can illuminate samples either from the right or from the left or with both. And what that does is it illuminates first from the right then from the left and then blends them together. So we'll do that later. But for now, we need to use just the right light sheet, okay? The next step is to click on the video button to begin rapid scanning, that's step four. So the video button is this one here. So if you click on this, you'll hear a noise. You typically won't see anything on the screen or not much on the screen, don't worry about that. What we now need to do is to look into the reservoir and see what's going on in there. 
So this is absolutely critical. Before we do anything else, we need to confirm that the light sheet is physically in the sample. So if this, this, this sort of diagram shows you, if this is the sample, the light sheet has to be in it. And we can only confirm that by eye. Okay, so that's what we're going to try and do. So if I look here, I can see something. Uh, it's unclear if, if, the, uh, if the light sheet is in the sample. So when you're in a situation like this, you need to look carefully and move the, thing, the sample around until you're sure it's being hit by the light sheet. Let me see if I can turn off the lights and make this a little bit easier to see. Okay. So yes, that actually did make things a little bit easier. I'm moving this out of the way just so the camera has a better angle. So you can see right now a few things. You can see three sheets. So I mentioned there are three sheets coming in from each side. Uh, right now we're using the right side. So the sheets are going right to left in this view. And uh, we also see there's kind of something really bright. That's actually the tip of the screw that's being hit by the light sheet. So we know if we're hitting the screw, we're not where the sample is, so I need to move in the Y dimension. So I'm gonna move, the screw is on top, I'm gonna to move it this way, that way, to bring the sample into position. So now, um, the light sheet is where the sample is, but it's above it. So now I'm gonna move in Z to see if I can get it in. So the Z drive is here, it's the one on the top, and you can see that. Let me see if I turn on the light again. The Z drive is this one. And then this is very important. How you move the Z is explained here. Um, what you do is you move the sample up and down. So if you rotate it clockwise, you move the sample up which is a way of imaging the bottom of the sample. This is risky because you're moving the sample towards the objective. Uh, so you have to be careful when you do that. Alternatively, if you rotate the, uh, that knob counterclockwise, the sample moves down. You can see the sample was there, now it's lower. And so you image the top of the sample because the sheet doesn't change its position. So right now, what I mentioned is, I think the sheet is above the sample, so we can't see it anymore. Let me turn off the lights again. The sheet is above the sample, so I'm going to turn it clockwise so that I raise the sample and hopefully get it into the light sheet. Here we go. So you can see how something is being illuminated. What, what you can see is that is the sample. And if you were here in person with me, you would see it has a slightly orange tinge. So if we kept going, we would go through the sample then we would see the light sheet again. And if we kept going even further, that is hitting the bottom of the sample. Okay, so if you have something like this, that means you're hitting uh, the bottle actually of the, the, the bottom of actually the sample holder. If you go in the other direction, the sample should appear. If you keep going, eventually we're out of the sample and we are now above it. So we wanna be in the sample and kind of near the top. So the reason for being near the top of the sample is this is a safety measure. When we're near, if you look here, when we're near the top of the sample, the sample is farther away from the objective, which is here. If we're imaging near the bottom of the sample, it's closer to the objective. So we wanna be far away as a safety measure, okay? So that's why I try to place it on the top of the sample, all right? So you can see here that what we've done is step five. We've looked into the reservoir. We should see the light sheet hitting the sample holder and the sample. We didn't. So we maneuvered the sample in X, Y, Z until the light sheet was going through the sample. Once it was hitting it, lowering the Z stage, lower the Z stage until the light sheet is going through the top of your sample. So we've done all of that. And here there's a sort of extra emphasis. The light sheet must be in the sample to avoid damage to the system. If you are not sure whether the light sheet is in the sample, stop and confirm that because if if it's not in the sample when you try to image it you're going to move around in a way that you will ultimately smash into it okay all right so the only other thing i need to do and this is just because i moved the objective out of the way to have a better sort of camera angle is to put that back in position and now we can go to the next step so step six 
is disengage joystick fast mode by pressing the rightmost button on the joystick once. So it refers to this button, I'm gonna press it. Select the proper laser for your fluorophore. So um, if I recall correctly, this sample did have uh, fluorophores, uh, so Alexa Fluor 568 fluorophores, which can be excited by the 561 laser that we are currently using, as you can see here. Okay. Step eight is to hit the minimum and maximum display icon, which is the sun and moon with stars picture on the right side of the imaging window. So the imaging window is this here, and you can see the icon that the instructions refer to. Let's see if I can, there we go, right there. So if I click on this, it does an auto contrast. It doesn't change the data, it just changes so we can see something. So now we're going to lower the objective until it is close to touching the DB. Once it is close, we'll lower it more slowly and we'll monitor the image to avoid hitting the sample. And it should start coming into focus. Okay, so. You can see now the objective is very far away from the sample. Moving it down this way is risky because we could crash into it. Not right now because I can actually physically see uh, it is just really far. So what we're going to do is lower it until you know, it's above the sample, but I can't track it very well anymore. So at that point, I'm going to switch to the screen. You can see that this kind of imaging we can do with the lights on, it's not a problem. Um, but I don't see anything here, and the reason is I need to auto-adjust the contrast. The things that I was seeing before were the reflections of the light on the dibenzyl ether. Uh, now, because of where the objective is, it's casting a shadow, so all the room lights uh, can't uh, sort of shade the sample much, okay? So, here we go. I'm gonna hit auto-contrast. And then what I'm going to do is while I'm looking at the screen, I am going to turn this knob, the course focus knob, gently down, so that way, while keeping track of what's happening on the screen. So I'm gonna do that right now. There'll be a flicker once I hit the, uh, the surface of the DBE. Okay. And so there, I'm back out of focus. So I wanna be in focus, so that's roughly in focus. You can see that this is very grainy and it's hard to see. And so if you're in a situation like this, it's a good idea to increase the exposure time so you can see things a little bit better. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do right now, but to increase the exposure time, I actually have to stop the live imaging. So I'm gonna click there and increase the exposure to 250 milliseconds from where it is right now, which is 50. I'm gonna to go to 250. And now, you know, it's sort of saturated, so I'm going to click again on the auto contrast. And now we can see a little bit better. It's not perfect, but we can at least see things a little bit better. You can, you can see the sample from the tip of the screw to the pedestal. You can see part of the screw, this pedestal, and this pedestal. Okay, so what's next? So what's next is to adjust the width of the light sheet to 100% to illuminate the entire field of view evenly. So let's do that. So you can see here, here's sort of, just to reiterate, um, the width of the light sheet refers to the width in the Y dimension. And so you can see right now, this part of the sample is way better illuminated than this part down here. And so we don't want that. We want nice and even illumination. And so the way we accomplish that is by increasing the sheet width. When we increase the sheet width by moving this to the right, you hear some noises and things get more even. Uh, let me see if I can, there we go. The illumination gets more even but dimmer because we're distributing the same amount of light over a bigger region. Okay. So now we're on step 11, center the sample in the field of view using the XY controls. Focus on a structure within the sample using the focus knob on the microscope. Okay, so we can do the following. I find it very, um, very useful to put on this here, which is a crosshair, so that we can see the middle. Um, so the reason I'm so concerned about placing the sample in the middle properly 
because on the light sheet, as you um, uh, know if you've seen the light sheet lecture video, uh, the middle is where you have the best quality. So it's really important to center your sample because you want as much of it as close to the middle as possible. So we, um, we're going to move this in the x dimension and then in the y dimension. And I think that's pretty centered. Okay, so now step 12. Uh, this step is critical for not, uh, so to, to kind of avoid damage to the sample. So in step 12, we're going to go to the top of the sample by rotating, rotating the Z knob counterclockwise, and we're going to set that as a as zero in the XYZ table Z window. Okay, so here's the sample. Here's the Z knob. We are going to move this until the sample is just out of focus. Uh, actually, uh, just out of the light sheet, excuse me. So, so there's, there's two things. Uh, that, that we need to keep track of here. This is different from kind of a normal microscope. One is focus, which is controlled by this knob. So once we are in focus here, we don't need to move this to change the Z position, like on a normal sort of confocal or wide field microscope. Instead, we use this, which moves the, the, the sample in and out of the light sheet, which doesn't take uh, change position. And according to these rules, turning it clockwise, raises the sample, so we image the bottom of it, turning it counterclockwise, uh, lowers the sample, so we image the top. Remember, the light sheet doesn't move. So this is, can be a little bit confusing. The main thing to remember is, whenever you're moving this that way, down, or this clockwise, so you're moving the sample up, um, be very careful because those are operations that could damage the sample. All right, so let's move the Z knob counterclockwise so that we go to the top of the sample. Again, the Z knob is the one on the top. I'm going to move that counterclockwise and see what happens on the screen. So if we don't see any movement, we can double check here whether it says mouse wheel or joystick and here to make sure that light is off. It seems it was off uh, so we, I, we are actually moving it. It's just the, the result is a little bit subtle, so I didn't notice it. Uh, so now I'm going to keep moving counterclockwise. And you can see sample, we're seeing smaller and smaller parts of the sample, which means it's slightly curved. So I want to keep going until I don't see anything. Once, that, once I'm in that position, I'm going to go here to XYZ table Z and click on set as zero. What that will do is it will tell the software, this is my zero position. Okay, so now if I, if I go into the sample, if I rotate clockwise, you'll see that those numbers increase and that tells me how deep I'm in the sample. Okay, so this number, keeping track of this is critical. We never want that number to be greater then 5,200, uh, sort of negative 5,200, and by greater I mean greater in absolute value. The reason being, that's the working distance of the objective. So if we go further than that, we run serious risks of smashing the objective into the sample. So we don't want that number to be bigger. Uh, so we need to keep track of it as we explore the sample by going into it. So I'm rotating the Z knob clockwise. Let's explore the sample and see how thick it is. So if I keep going, We are now at about 1.5 millimeters deep. I think this sample is just a few millimeters in size. So if we keep going, keep going, and that's it. So the sample you can see uh, is 2.8 or 2.9 millimeters thick. So that's from the very top of the sample to the very bottom. Uh, since we want to image the entire sample, we're going to set that position as the start and then the zero position, I just typed in zero, as the end. So these buttons uh, tell it to take the current position as the start or take the current position as the end of the Z stack. I accidentally clicked that. So I want the end to be zero. And then the step size uh, 
this is usually a number between say two and five and we will discuss that later. Uh, I'm just gonna make it five, okay? So if I wanted to take a z-stack of this sample, at least with these settings, I would be covering a range of 2,870 microns in this five micron step sizes, so I would get 575 images. Um, why do we fix the end at zero and the start deep in the sample? The reason is when we, when we do our z-stack, we want to end the z-stack with the sample far from the objective. And that is what occurs when the light sheet is at the top of the sample. When the light sheet is at the top of the sample, as you can see in this diagram, it's going to be farther from the objective, which is gonna be up here, compared to when the light sheet is at the bottom of the sample. So we wanna end Z stacks with the sample far away from the objective to minimize the chance that once we're done with the Z stack, we move something and crash either the objective into the sample or the sample into the objective. So that's the reason uh, for setting things up that way. Uh, you can see that that covers step 13 to set the top of the sample as the end of the z-stack in the XYZ table Z window. So the next step is going to be adjusting the zoom. Uh, adjusting the zoom is uh, fairly elaborate, so I'm going to pause the video and reset uh, so you can see what we're doing. <laughs> 